don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell. Welcome back. Thank God we're finally done with the multiple choice. If you even watch those videos, God bless you. That was a horrible multiple choice section. Hated it myself, personally. I could only imagine how you felt about it. But now on to bigger and better things. We're going to start these short answer problems, numbers 25 through 31. We get the calculator. Let's do this. And just a quick reminder, these are short answer. There are eight questions in here. We're not going to cover all eight in this video. But each correct answer receives two credits. You can get partial credit here. This is not multiple choice anymore. Clearly indicate necessary steps, including appropriate formulas, substitutions, diagrams, graphs, charts, etc. cetera. Um, for all questions in this part, a correct numerical answer with no work shown will still get one credit. You still get 50% of the, if these are two points and you get one, that's 50%. You get a half credit. If there's a problem that you cannot do algebraically, but you can do it in the calculator, on the graph, do it, write down the answer, nothing else, and you'll get half credit. Boom, let's start. 25, and the two point Short answer questions are typically really easy. Comparatively to the short, uh, to the multiple choice, these will be a lot easier. But let's take a look at this. A business office at a local college wishes to determine the method of payment that will be used by students when buying books at the beginning of the semester. Explain how the office can gather appropriate sample that minimizes bias. When it wants to minimize bias, we just got to make sure that it's done randomly. And I don't have to do any math. I, I just have to explain. So I'm going to use my words, OK? I'm going to say randomly ask every third or fourth or whatever. Randomly ask every third student, you know, I don't know, in the union or on, on, on campus. Okay, you want to say in the bookstore, whatever. But you just randomly ask every third student. Don't just ask the, 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 the football team. Don't just ask, you know, uh, the people in the engineering department. Just randomly ask every third student because there is no bias whatsoever when it is completely random. Mm -hmm. Determine the solution of the square root of 3x plus 7 equals x minus 1 algebraically. Again, if you couldn't do this algebraically, I would like you to put this into y1, the left side, and put this into y2 in the calculator on the right side. These aren't fractions, I'm just saying. And then use your intercept function and see where they intersect. And just write down the answer. You'll get one point out of the two. But I'm going to show you how to do this algebraically. Okay? You can use your calculator to check your work. All right? I am going to get rid of that square root symbol. It's nasty. So I'm going to square both sides. This goes away with this, and I got 3x plus 7 equals x minus 1 times x minus 1. Okay, I'm going to foil this. Gives me x squared minus 1x minus another 1x. Negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. So we got x squared. These will combine to be negative 2x plus 1. x squared minus 2x plus 1. All right, I clearly have a quadratic. I have terms that have x's, but I cannot combine them. So I cannot make this equation x equals. Okay, because I have multiple terms with x's that I cannot combine. So I'm going to bring everything over to the left side. Okay, and then I've got a quadratic where I can just factor and solve. So 0 equals x squared minus 5x minus 6. Two numbers that multiply to be negative 6 that add or combine to be negative 5. It's x minus 6 and x plus 1. Negative 6 and positive 1. 
If I multiply them, it's negative 6. And if I just combine them, it's negative 5. We're good. So now we just... <laughs> oh, man, the ink. Love the ink. I take x minus 6, set it equal to 0, and solve. I add 6 to both sides, and x equals 6. Same thing, x plus 1 equals 0. Subtract 1 from both sides, and x equals negative 1. Now, before I leave this problem, let's take a look at what we started with right here. Anytime there's square roots or there's fractions, I can have something that doesn't work. What do I mean? If I plug a 6 in there, and I should check this, in for both of these x's, I get 3 times 6 plus 7 under a square root equals 6 minus 1. So that's 18 plus 7 is 25, and the square root of 25 is 5. Well, 6 minus 1 is also 5. So 6 works. Circle that. But if I throw a negative 1 in there, square root of 3 times negative 1 plus 7, I know right off the bat, first of all, that's sloppy writing, but I know it's not going to work because negative 1 minus 1 is going to give me negative 2. I will never get a negative when I square root something. It's impossible. But let's just finish the problem anyways. Negative 3 plus 7 is 4, the square root of 4, and that's 2. 2 does not equal negative 2. Whenever there's an answer that doesn't work, it tries to work. You see what I'm saying? But it just doesn't. So do not have negative 1 as an answer. Just cross that out. You have one answer, and that's at x equals 6. The population... This is number 27, by the way. The population of bacteria, P of T, in hundreds after T hours can be modeled by the function P of T equals 37 times E raised to the 0.0532T. Hmm, fancy. Determine whether the population is increasing or decreasing over time. Explain your reasoning. All right. When I think of growth and decay, I think of an equation as like y equals some starting value, I don't know, I'll just call it a, and then I either have 1 plus or minus my rate raised to time, okay? If this number, we'll just call it plus for now, if this number is bigger than 1, it's growing, okay? So it's, if it's uh, greater than the number 1, it's growth or it's increasing. If this number is less than the number 1, it's decreasing. So let's take a look at our equation. P of T, that's like our Y, equals 37. Okay, that's like our A. Uh, times E to the 0 0.0532, and I'll put a T right here. Oh, well, this T is like this T. So really... My 1 plus r, which is going to determine whether it's, it's increasing or decreasing, is like e raised to the 0 0.0532. So all i got to do is see if this is bigger than 1 or less than 1. That's it. So in my calculator, because we have it the whole entire time, I'm going to turn this on. Uh, get out of here, and I'm going to say E, which is the number above the LN in blue. So I just said seconds, LN. 0 0.0532, and I'm going to hit enter. That's 1.054, whatever. Let's call that 1.05, okay? So this is 1.05. All right, so that's bigger than 1, so it's increasing. They want me to explain my answer, you son of a guns. So I'm going to say it is increasing since e to the 0 0.0532 
is bigger. I don't even have to use inequality. Is bigger than one. Instead of writing is bigger than one, I like to write less. I can say is greater than one. They can write it that way. It doesn't matter. Here's your, your explaining in words. If you knew what you were doing, you don't have to write all this stuff here. You should probably at least write this down and show that it's equal to 1.05. And that's all you would need to do. But again, I'm doing this video for explaining purposes, so I want to show you. Number 28. The polynomial function g of x, which is x cubed plus a x squared minus 5 plus 6, has a factor of x minus 3. Determine the value of a. All right, so I got to, I mean, this is kind of a strange question, but it's easy if you um, understand factors and roots and solutions and zeros. They want me to solve for that a. All right, that, that's the, the issue here. I got to solve for that a. Then the only piece of information they give me besides the equation is that I have a factor of x minus 3. So if I were to solve that, if that were one of my factors, and I solve that, I find the solution to that factor. I say x minus 3 equals 0. And if I add 3 to both sides, my answer is x would equal 3. That is a solution. Solutions are also known as roots. They're also known as x-intercepts, but here's the important one. They're also known as zeros. How come they're known as zeros? Because if I take x equals 3 and put it into each one of these x's, it would equal 0. And that's exactly what I'm going to do to solve for a. So 0 equals my x is 3, so it's 3 in for x cubed, plus a times x, which is 3 squared, minus 5 times x, which is 3, plus 6. That is a very simple algebra problem. So let's do this. Oh, we got 9. Oh, yeah, I'll be okay. 3 squared is 9, but 3 cubed is 27, plus 3 squared is 9. 9 times a is just 9a. Minus 5 times 3 is 15, plus 6. All okay, right, and that equals 0. Okay, okay. So uh, 27 minus 15 is 8. Yeah, I lied, it's 12. 12 plus 6 is 18. Okay, so we've got 18 plus 9a equals 0. All right? 0. Subtract 18 and divide by 9. I mean, I don't know how much easier this is going to get. And again, it's probably easier than when I hit the, the ink here and it actually changes colors. So I'm going to subtract 18 from both sides. For the sake of space, I got negative 18 equals 9a, and I divide by 9. So if I did that right, my answer for A is negative 2. Number 29. Write a recursive formula for the sequence 189, 63, 21, 7, and so forth. Now, I don't know how I'm getting from 189 to 63, but I know I get from 21 to 17 Obviously, I'm not adding or subtracting the same number as I go from term to term, but I am multiplying, okay, well, I'm dividing by 3, but instead of saying dividing by 3, I'm going to say that's multiplying by one-third, okay? So I'm going to multiply by a third, and guess what? That's the same way I get from 189 to 63, I multiply by a third, and the same way to 63 to 21, I multiply by a third. So my common factor, okay, my common ratio is one-third, all right? They want us to write a recursive formula. By definition, a recursive formula means they have to give you the first term. They have to. And then you find every other term by using that first term, meaning I can't find the second term unless I have the first term. 
Once I have the second term, okay, I use the second term to find the third term and so forth. So I always got to go back to the previous term. And if I don't have at least one term to start with, I can't figure anything out. So I'm going to say A of 1, which is my first term, I'm going to start with 189. And it looks like in order to find the second term, okay, and plus 1, okay, in order to find that next term, well, no, in order to find the next term, we'll just call, use n for next. I got to take the previous term. So I take a, so if, I'm, if n is 2, I want to find the second term. Well, I take my 2 and I subtract 1. I got to use, okay, a to the 1. Let me say that one more time. If n is 2, like I want to find the second term, a to the 2. Don't I need to take the first term and multiply it times a third? Yeah, so how do I write, if my n is 2, how do I get 1? Well, don't I take 2 minus 1, so it's n minus 1? That's why this is n minus 1. That just means the previous term. That, this is really all you needed to write, as long as you remembered what a recursive formula was. Oh, nice. Some good old-fashioned algebra. Solve algebraically for x to the nearest thousandth. Now, my friends, if you're like, I can't solve for E, you should be able to. Okay, You should solve with E in there. You're solving for X. E is a number. Okay, If you couldn't, you could still put this into Y1, and you could put this into Y2, and your answer is where they intersect to the nearest thousandths. That's three decimal places. You write that down and you get one of your two points. But well, we're going to do this algebraically because we can, man. All right. I'm going to solve for my x. I'm going to solve for this x right here. Which means, uh, first, let's, let's start to pull things away from it. Starting with that 2. So I'm going to divide both sides by 2. So I've got e to the 0.49x equals. I can leave that as a fraction, or if I put that in the calculator, it turns out to be nice and even. It's 7.5. Okay. Now the problem is, my x is in the uh, exponent. But what you should remember, okay, is that natural log and E's cancel. So I have this remaining, 0.49x. That's, it's not an exponent anymore. It kind of just drops and becomes a, a coefficient and variable. What I do to one side, I have to do to the other. So the ln of 7.5. Looks to me, friends, it looks to me, friends, that we only got to do one more thing to solve for that x, and that's just divide by 0 0.49. G gentlemen, ladies, everyone here, just put this in a calculator. Because right now, these are going to cancel, and I have my x is approximately or equal to, because we're going to equal it, it's going to be three decimal places. I'm going to put the ln of 7.5 in the calculator. Ln is the button to the left of 4. 7.5. And I'm going to divide that by 0 0.49. 4.112. I'm going to round this thousands, three places. That will stay at 2 because the number after it is less than 5. Okay, 4.112. which is the point of intersection you have gotten if you would have graphed those in the calculator without doing any of the work. God, I love these problems. These are so much better than the multiple choice. For all values of x for which the expression is defined. That, thank you for that, that like legal statement, so to speak. But this is the important part. Write the expression below in simplest form. I'm just going to factor until I can't factor anymore. Okay, simplest form does not say solve for x. I'm just going to have to factor and cancel. And I tell you what, in my class, I see that that top uh, numerator, I'll say, is four terms. I cannot pull a GCF out of all four terms. So that is going to be a factor by grouping. 
I'm going to take the first two terms, and I'm going to take the last two terms. I'm going to factor a GCF out of each. I can take an x squared out of that first blue parenthesis, and that will leave me with 2x plus 1. The red parenthesis, I also want to take a GCF out so that it also has a 2x plus 1. Okay. That means I have to take out a negative 9. All right. All over. Now, the bottom here, I can only take out a GCF. I can take out an X. That will leave me 3 minus X. Okay. So, what can I do now? Well, the top is not factored completely yet. The top I did factor by grouping. Now, what I need to do, yeah. There we go. Now what I need to do is I take both my GCFs, put them in one parenthesis, and then I take the other term, which is 2x plus 1, and write that in one parenthesis. I do not have to write that twice. Over 3 minus x, and there's an x in front of that. Now you might say to yourself, Visca, there's still nothing I can cancel. No, not yet. But, my friends... This is a DOPS. That's a difference of perfect squares. That's x plus 3 times x minus 3. Now there's something I can cancel. Okay? Be careful because this test is a nasty SOB and they're always trying to trick you. If I have two terms, x minus or 3 and 3 minus x, and they are flipped around a minus sign. It's the 3 in front minus the x in back. Here it flips. It's the x in front minus the 3 in back. If they are flipped around a minus sign, I can cancel them, but it has to leave a negative 1 in one of their places. Okay. Uh, if they are flipped around a plus sign, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. They will cancel without any problem. But if they are flipped around a minus sign, I cancel them out, and it leaves me a negative 1. So now there's nothing else I can do. I'm just going to rewrite this, okay? I have negative 1 out front. I don't have to write the 1, but I, I mean, I'll put it here. Times x plus 3 and 2x plus 1. All over, the only thing on the bottom is my x. That's it. That is simplified. That is factored completely. And guess what? We are done with problems 25 through 31. Look at us go. That's not too bad. A million times easier than the multiple choice. I keep saying that. I'll see you for the last video, which is what? 26 through 37 or something like that? Or 32 through 37? Yeah. See ya. Bye. Don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell.